Hey, ABC, I uh, wanted to share a special opportunity with you. Um, as you're aware, there's a crisis unfolding in Afghanistan, continues. And we've been exploring and praying about how we can help. Obviously, prayer is important. We had a great prayer night last week. Um, but we want to tangibly help if possible. And so, Tom, tell us about our partnership with Mighty Oaks and what we might be able to do. Well, as many of you know, Mighty Oaks, with the veterans, many of them served in Afghanistan. And so what's transpiring there for them is heart-wrenching. Uh, most of them had translators, people that they worked with that were Afghan nationals. Uh, in fact, I, I got a video from the founder of, of Mighty Oaks, uh, of the family that he stayed with eight different times, that he would say, that these, these people saved my life. Uh, and, and they needed safety. And so he was orchestrating through the organization that you can support and that we're supporting as a church right now, their exit from the country. And they just sent this heart-wrenching video, uh, the family of eight, just saying, thank you. Thank you for saving our lives. Uh, when you see something like that, your, your heart goes out to them. And you can imagine how the veterans feel, you know, that the, their lives are indebted to them. And we just want to come alongside them and these people that are in desperate need right now and be able to support them. Yeah, so we spoke with the leadership of Mighty Oaks and they have boots on the ground in Afghanistan and they formed a coalition with three nonprofit organizations. And if, if we help support that financially, it's literally going to fund cargo planes mm -hmm. and fuel and getting Afghan nationals out of the country right now today as we speak. I think they said something like a thousand per day uh, they were expecting to be able to transport. Yeah, they're they're hoping to get a thousand out a day. Uh, they've had some good success already. Things are deteriorating rapidly, as you know, so they're changing. These are very innovative, creative people, and they're not getting the government assistance. So they're doing this uh, solo. They're on their own, and uh, that's what makes it even more precarious. Uh, so these heroes, um, we, we, we want to support them. Yeah. So as a church and as a leadership, uh, we actually had a great conversation with our elders yesterday, and we decided uh, that we would like to invest $10,000 in this effort as a church in faith and trusting that maybe some of you would come alongside of us as well. We'd like to be able to invest even more. And so we're asking for you to consider, would you partner with us in helping this effort to save some of these um, Afghan nationals. The amazing thing too is they're already planning some follow-up uh, with these refugees and they hope to get them into legacy programs, the week-long programs where they can share the gospel with them. And so, yeah, there's going to be tremendous post-traumatic stress for these people, as you can imagine. You know, imagine being a father or mother knowing that, you know, your child, you know, is not only at risk, but uh, not only horrifying death, but sex trafficking and all the other kinds of things that would be a, a part of their experience. So, we're asking you that you might participate financially as well. We'd love to more than double that. Uh, you know, obviously as a church, we're going to make an investment, uh, but you are the church. You are the body of Christ, and we're just asking. I know Gail and I are going to make a contribution, and I hope you do too. Uh, just make it to ABC. We'll kind of get all the money together, and we'll send off one check. It'll be a lot easier that way. Yeah, so you can donate to the GoFund um, by going to abcchurch.org. Click on Give. And then there's a drop down where you can select the GoFund and make a memo in there of uh, Mighty Oaks or just simply write Afghan Rescue. Um, and we'll know what that's for and we'll compile that all up, as Tom said, and we'll make sure that they get those funds immediately. And we'll keep you posted. We'll let you know um, how much comes in. If you decide to use a check um, with our paper envelopes, same thing, just uh, write on the memo there. Um, there's a box to list GoFund and then write Mighty Oaks on the memo or Afghan Rescue. So thank you for partnering with us. Uh, we're hopeful that we can really contribute significantly to help this effort um, quickly. So pray with us for this country. Pray with us for Mighty Oaks and the leadership of Mighty Oaks and trust that God's going to continue moving. Amen. Thank you. Welcome. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us again. Um, this is kind of a weird uh, sermon for me in that it's my last one. And uh, for those of you who have joined us online for a while now, uh, we want to just say thank you. Uh, we're, we're thrilled that you are taking advantage of the opportunity to be a part of ABC, even though you may not physically be able to be here uh, by watching us online. 
these 18 months of us learning how to do this, talking into a camera. Uh, the bottom line is it's probably made us all who are, who are uh, preaching on Sundays better communicators. And, uh, and in an effort to, to be effective in terms of ministry and reaching you, uh, we've just counted it a real privilege to, to be able to do this, and certainly I have. So uh, thanks for, for being a part of things. Um, you know, when I was trying to think about what my last message might be, they gave me the kind of freedom, do anything you want at your last week. And uh, for a guy like me, that's like the hardest thing in the world. You know, what do you say for your last sermon? And all of a sudden I started stressing out, you know, started feeling a lot of pressure, like, what am I going to say on my last sermon? I'm terrible at topics. You know, I'm, I'm an expository guy. I go verse by verse. And, and so I was kind of at a, a bit of a quandary. And then in my own devotional time, I, I came across a passage of scripture that I've loved and thought, you know, I'm just going to use this passage of scripture, kind of exposit it and uh, draw some parallels into my own ministry and life. Uh, so this is going to be a very different uh, kind of sermon um, than maybe you've heard before. Uh, it, it'll be kind of personal as well. So uh, in John chapter three, verse 30, uh, John the Baptist, okay, um, uh, he says this, I must, or excuse me, he must increase, but I must decrease. I've always been drawn to that. Uh, I love John the Baptist. He's one of my favorite uh, heroes in the Bible. Uh, I think he's an amazing role model for all of us. Um, so get the setting here, okay? So John the Baptist for nine months has been the talk of the town. I mean, everybody loves this guy. In fact, they love him so much that they're willing to go walk all the way out in the desert to listen to him. Uh, and, and then something happens, and the crowd begins to dis dissipate, okay? Uh, and uh, John's friends come to him and say, Hey, you remember that guy uh, that you baptized um, that you were talking about? Remember you baptized him at the Jordan? Um, everybody's going to him now. And guess what? He's baptizing people like we're baptizing people. And what are you going to do about it? Um, <laughs> and this is what he says to that question. Okay, This is how he responds when they say, Hey, this guy's becoming more popular than you. What's the deal with that? Right? And this is what he says. Verse 26, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom... You have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. What do I think about it? Basically, he says, I'm thrilled. I couldn't be happier. And then he says these great words, he must increase, but I must decrease. Um, I'd like to kind of break this down for us, if I could, uh, and draw some parallels. Um, number one is know your role. Uh, I have been sent ahead of him. Um, he enjoyed, John enjoyed a great following for a season. And, uh, and he tells his disciples, you know, these people were ours for a season, but they were never really ours. Uh, they were given to us by God, and they were given for a season. It's amazing how in ministry so many times um, people start to think more like owners and uh, so they, they kind of feel like it's theirs. And, um, and in reality, we need to think more like ranch managers. A ranch manager doesn't look at the cattle and look at the facilities, the buildings, the barns, look at the property, the expanse of the ranch and say, you know, this stuff's all mine. No, he says, no, this stuff is not mine. Uh, the, the, the owner of this ranch has hired me to be a ranch manager, to take care of all of this stuff. That's what a ranch manager does. And I really think it's helpful in ministry if we think more like ranch managers. You can kind of tell that just in the way people talk. You listen carefully to the pronouns. Uh, when you hear people say, my church, 
when you hear pastors refer to it as my church, my people, uh, my staff, um, when, when you hear a church, but it's not identified by the church name, it's identified by the pastor uh, of the church rather than the church's name itself. These are things that for me have kind of scared me historically. And uh, so I've, I've done a lot of things to kind of insulate myself from that in, in terms of ministry. And, and the reason is because I was kind of a, afraid of myself. I was afraid of my own ego. Um, it doesn't take much to convert over and have a owner mindset rather than a stewardship mindset. Um, when I came to Atascadero Bible Church, when Gail and I actually, I should say we, <laughs> pronouns are important. When we came to Atascadero Bible Church, um, I had come from a mega church, uh, had intentions of going back to that mega church. I was a designated as a church planter from that church. Um, uh, in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, maybe one day I might even be the lead pastor of that church, Los Gatos Christian Church. I uh, never voiced that. In fact, it's the first time I've ever even said that out loud. Uh, but in my head, it wasn't beyond the realm of possibility in terms of my own thinking. And so when we graduated from seminary, there wasn't an opportunity for me at the church that, that I was interested in. Uh, they were going to do another church plant. They'd already done one in, in three to five years. I felt like that was a long time that I needed to get more experience. So I started candidating for churches and, and ended up, we ended up here at ABC. And what's interesting is, is that God tested me on that commitment, my resolve for ABC immediately, right out of the gate. In fact, day one, the first day, November 1st, 1984, when we got here, the job that I would have taken at Los Gatos Christian Church, and that is the college pastor job that was the pastor of 300 college students, which was really not in youth ministry. It was really in, a, in young adult ministry, which is something that I was interested in. I wasn't interested in going into youth ministry. I was interested in, in adult ministry and, and ultimately preaching. And that day that I came here, <clears throat> that job became available, and I got a phone call that literally said, hey, Jerry's leaving. He's going to start a church in Salinas. The job's open if you're interested. To which I had to say, I literally just got here. I can't leave now. And then over the next two years, uh, the senior pastor at Los Gatos Christian Church started sending people my way. Four different churches, churches that were anywhere from two to three times the size of a Tascadero Bible Church. Back then, we were a church of about 140. They, they literally, he said, you know, these are churches. I'd like to throw your name in the hat, to which I said, I'm not interested. To his surprise and to my own surprise. In other words, I didn't even send a resume, didn't candidate, none of those things. And the reason was, was because I was afraid of myself. I was afraid that somehow that I might sell my soul, that I might um, be in ministry for purposes that were less than noble, um, to make a name for myself, uh, those kinds of things. I, I was very competitive. I, I certainly, um, with the, my background and all that, I could have easily gone down that route, and, and I was afraid of that. I wanted to be in ministry for the right reasons. When God called me, you know, when I when when I was at Santa Clara University, and literally, um, I, I had a moment where I felt like I was standing kind of at a crossroads, and, and one road was money. It really was. I was a business major. I was headed for the financial district of San Francisco, following my uncle, um, a venture capitalist, uh, and and going in that direction. And then there was this opportunity for ministry and a call to ministry. And here it is, money or ministry. And, and on that day that I said, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you, I was all in. It meant kind of turning my back on that other path. And so now it's being tested. Time and time again, it gets tested, right? And so it, it's really important to understand, you know, know your role. My role, I'm a manager. Uh, I'm not an owner. And uh, ABC has never been my church, never been Tom Farrell's church. It's always been ABC, and I'm very proud of that. 
and I know this that it, it was uh, it was in a sense I was a manager for a season all right secondly stay in your lane he says this I'm not the Christ but I've been sent ahead of him he knew he wasn't the Messiah and he wanted his followers to understand that and then he says this verse 29 great analogy by the way he who has the bride is the bridegroom right but the friend of the bridegroom, which we would call the best man, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Now, have you ever been at a wedding where, um, where the best man or the maid of honor, um, usually because they were drunk, um, uh, you know, kind of makes a spectacle of themselves and in their speech says something that's so wholly inappropriate that the people that are sitting there are mortified. You know, usually they double down and compound it when they get out on the dance floor um, and, and make fools of themselves as well. I think we've all been to weddings like that. And, and the, the takeaway for those of us who are a little bit older is what a shame. They made it about them, but it was really about the bride and the groom. How inappropriate. This is exactly what John is saying. And, and I would just say this. So many times people in ministry, they are so insecure that they end up making it about them rather than the bride and the groom. Uh, humility is that you have a proper view of yourself. And I think it's very important, particularly for those in ministry, to remind themselves daily of who we are and who we are not. See, the best man attends to the groom and his bride. And that's what I've tried to do through my ministry is attend to and pronounce and announce the groom, that is Jesus himself, and, and take care of the bride and make her more beautiful. And, uh, and um, I love the church. I love the bride and i um, grateful for the opportunity. Uh, then third is this, the beauty of decreasing. When he says in verse 30, I must increase, or he must uh, increase, I must decrease. Um, let's, let's just be honest. This concept of, of decrease or diminishing is something that we are all kind of resistant to. And yet the reality is this, um, that over time, we all will be forgotten. <laughs> in fact, Probably, and I don't know this to be a fact, but I would guess that 90% of people don't know their great-grandfather's full name. All right? Uh, when you think about that, one thing that we need to remember, it's always Jesus. Whoever was the manager for a season, we don't remember their names. You won't be remembered. I won't be remembered. I'm okay with that. John the Baptist was okay with that. Because Jesus is really what matters. Um, statistically, we know that the average senior pastor stays at his church for four years. The average youth pastor less than three years, about two and a half years for the average youth pastor. One out of every ten people who start out in pastoral ministry actually retire as ministers. Okay, So at the end of their career, retire as ministers, one out of 10. The, the number of guys that have had actually been at one church for their entire ministry, it is probably less than 1%. I can't prove that. I don't know that for a fact. I just know that, that it's very, very unusual. So I happen to be one of those guys in an unusual category. But here's what I've observed. That many pastors who retire from ministry, that one out of 10, who actually end up retiring from ministry, do so with some degree of hurt or resentment. And it's my belief that it's because that pastor has been reticent or reluctant to have honest conversations personally and with the Lord and, and even with their church. And so when a church is put in a position, an awkward position of needing to have an awkward conversation with a pastor to help them come to an understanding that it's time for a transition. If it doesn't come from the pastor himself, it's very, very hard on everyone, particularly the church. And it's my feeling that, um, that, that there's a lack of self-awareness so many times uh, for guys, particularly that are aging in ministry. And the reason that they feel hurt is because it's like, 
I've been serving these people my whole life. I still have a lot of good years left in me. I'm still valuable. How is it that they would turn on me like this? And then there's these camps, you know, those who are for me and those who are, are, are against me. And, and, and how could they do this to me after all these years, after all I've done for them? Friends, we just need to be honest. Over time, we all diminish. Over time, we will all be forgotten. And you know what? According to John the Baptist, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And I'm okay with it, all right? Just so you understand that. Fourth, I want to say this. Don't drop the baton, all right? Don't drop the baton. Now, we've got to go to Hebrews for this. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, halfway through verse 1, says, Let us run the race with endurance, okay? Let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You've heard it said that the Christian life is a marathon. I, I would say no. The Christian life is an ultra, ultra marathon. Okay? In fact, the clock is still ticking. It's been going for 2,000 years plus, and it's still running. It is a long race. No one has ever run that long. There have been multiple handoffs for these 2,000 years. That's the way it's supposed to go. And we need some perspective. Right now, even ABC, we need some perspective. Okay, I've been running for 37 years here. That's a long time. And I feel like God's telling me it's time to hand it off to the next runner. Why? Because in another passage of scriptures, as Paul says this, run the race in such a way that you might win. In other words, we're actually trying to win here, right? If you want to win, then the best way to win is you get runners who run hard, who hand the baton off, who don't drop it, and then the next guy starts running. I mean, how many times have you watched the Olympics or other things and you've got this amazing team and they're running and all of a sudden in the exchange, there's a drop of the baton and they lose the race as a result of that. And you think, man, if you just didn't drop the baton, you would have won. I got to be honest, <laughs> I think the church is horrible at the handoff. Uh, I've seen so many times when the baton gets dropped and, uh, and I have said this, in my own ministry, in my own life, man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to drop the baton. I want to hand it off. I want to run hard. I don't want to crawl to the next guy, you know. I don't want to stumble to the next guy. I want to run hard, hand it off clean, be ready to go, and then I want to see that next guy take off and run hard. So whenever there's a, a, a relay race, you watch it the next time, okay? And you watch the first, second, and third guy, okay? What happens after they run? What happens after they hand off the baton? You know what happens? They become a cheerleader. They literally become cheerleaders. They're jumping up and down, cheering for the next guy. Why? Because they want their team to win. I believe that's what's supposed to happen in the church. That we're supposed to hand the baton off and we're supposed to cheer them on. And, uh, and you know, my feeling is this. I love the bride so much that I believe that the church deserves a passionate, invigorated leader. And large churches like ours not only need a passionate, invigorated leader, they need a passionate, invigorated leader who invests intentionally in the staff because that's really how ministry takes place in the staff and in the people okay, of the church. And the staff is called the equip the people. We're going to talk about that a little bit next week. But, but here's the thing is that I really believe that over time, you know, um, over time, fatigue begins to set in. And I'll be 100% honest with you, after 37 years, there is some fatigue that has set in even in my life. And I believe ABC deserves a passionate leader and our staff deserves a passionate leader. Um, the church is being left in great hands. And I can say that with great confidence. I can also say this, I'm not bitter. Uh, no one has forced me out. There have never been any awkward conversations that people have had to have with me. In fact, for those of you who've known me for a while, I've been talking about this for a long time, uh, for, for over a decade, because I think it's been important to think about the future. You know, in fact, uh, one of the guys on crew named Alan, uh, two years ago when we made an announcement that, uh, that uh, you know, I'm going to be here for two years, there's going to be a transition with Jeff Erke. You know what he said to me the next week? He said, you know, I've heard of a two-week notice, but I've never heard of a two-year notice. 
<laughs> I gave a two-year notice, man. So the, there's no surprise here. You know, we've been talking about this for a long time. In fact, the people that don't go to ABC anymore that I get to see occasionally, they'll say to me, hey, aren't you retired? And uh, in other words, they've known that that would be a real thing. I grew up in the Bay Area as a San Francisco Giants fan. And uh, I'll date myself a little bit. My hero was uh, Willie Mays. And as a kid watching Willie Mays, the Say Hey Kid, uh, I mean, I can remember the, the, the video re being replayed of this catch he made running over his shoulder. And, and, and it was in New York at the time. And so, you know, we would practice as little kids. We'd and I'd use tennis balls a lot of times. And we'd have our friends throw the ball over our shoulder. And we'd run as hard as we can to try to make a catch like Willie Mays, you know. And uh, he was my hero, but sadly, he played way past his prime. And that was sad to see, you know, when, when a great ball player like Willie Mays plays past his prime. And, and frankly, I, I never wanted that to be me. I never did. And uh, a lot of times we see that in, in ministry as well. And so uh, anyway, I hope that helps you understand kind of what's going on here and the rationale for why we're making the transition and, and when we're making the transition. And then uh, fifth, finally, I, I will say this, never alone. You don't do this by yourself. Um, my hero uh, in this life is my wife. Uh, she is a rock star, in my opinion, and she is the rock of our family. Um, she has sacrificed more than any person uh, for the last 37 years for this church, for ABC, and done so in, in many, many, many ways. Uh, words cannot describe, and I'm not just saying this, words cannot describe how valuable she has been to ABC and to me. And uh, her her role was is remarkable. In fact, just, uh, just the other day, I received this nice letter from a good friend of ours, uh, Christy Barefoot, and she wrote some really thoughtful, nice things. She understands ministry um, unlike anybody I've ever met, just saying, okay? Um, she, she's remarkable. And this is what she says about Gail. Let me read this to you. Gail, I know the helpmate that you have been to Tom. He has leaned on your way of discerning how things could affect the body of Christ, your family, and your witness. You have been the best partner in ministry I have ever known in a pastor's wife. I have always appreciated your first responder kind of heart. You run to hurt, the wounded, the devastated, the grieving. You've been willing to be there, sometimes with Tom, but sometimes on your own. Not many run to the fire, most hold back. Not knowing what to say, etc., but not you. You go prayerfully waiting on the Holy Spirit to lead you. You pray over all things and people. You are able to verbalize on behalf of that situation in such a way as a comfort, and that is always memorable. Um, any guy in ministry can tell you that it's way harder for his wife, the pastor's wife, than it is for him. And... Um, Everybody has stories. <laughs> Everybody's had experiences. Everyone had pain as a result of that. And I just want to say uh, in all sincerity to my amazing wife, Gail, thank you. Thanks for being my refuge. Uh, thanks for making our home a safe place. Uh, thank you for um, allowing for me to do what God's called me to do. Uh, you're the one who sacrificed, not me. Uh, and um, and thank you for not giving up, you know, when you were hurt multiple times um, by people. Uh, so many pastors' wives I have seen have retracted and pulled back, um, and you didn't. You stayed engaged to the very end, and for that I just want to say thank you. Never alone. We don't do this by ourselves, and uh, I'm super grateful. So today really represents... Um, or, or, you know, um, this time <laughs> represents a decommissioning in a sense of me as lead pastor. Um, it's kind of like a, a ship, in a sense, being taken out of service. And a re, or, or a commissioning, we should say, of, uh, of Jeff Erke as our next lead pastor. And, 
uh, if you're going to be here on Sunday, uh, I would invite you to be a part of that because we're going to be able to do that with our congregation and, and a commissioning service for, for Jeff as well on Sunday. And then, um, you know, uh, there, it, there's a recommissioning in a sense of Gail and myself for a purpose and a future that, that, that God knows. Um, don't be sad for me. Be happy. This is something that I have relished in the sense of not my retirement, but the, the, the 37 years of ministry ha have, have been a dream for me, serving God for all of these years. Um, and being able to prepare next generation leaders, uh, being able to hand off the baton without dropping it, those are all things I aspired to. I benefited from it personally. I was handed the baton at the prime of my life, ministry-wise. Uh, the church benefited from it in a great way. I am so excited about the future of ABC. Uh, I love ABC. I really do. And I really believe this is in the best interest of ABC. And people ask, well, so what's next for you, Tom? To be honest, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I appreciate the question. Um, I am going to be a great cheerleader. I'm going to be a part of ABC. Um, I'm going to do everything I can to be the best, uh, best lay person I can possibly be. I'm going to be involved in missions. I'm going to be involved in the Big K Kingdom, the Big C Church. Uh, I believe that God is moving me into a place of fueling church planting movements. Uh, I won't do so in a lead position necessarily, identifying leaders. Uh, helping to fuel them, to facilitate them, to see exponential church planting movements. Uh, that's been my passion. I'm just going to be able to give a lot more attention to that. And so, uh, frankly, um, don't worry about that part of it. Uh, I would just say this. I'm just grateful for the time. The time to be with you, the time to be at ABC. It's been an amazing run these 37 years. I'm very happy to be running pretty close to full speed <laughs> and handing it off uh, to somebody who, who can run hard. And he's got a great team to do so as well. Uh, would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much. I mean, all, all I can say, I mean, how, all I can say is thank you. That you would call somebody like me it is, um, is, is crazy. You know, that you would use somebody like me uh, is remarkable. It's, it's totally a testimony to you, not me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful, God, for this season. And, uh, Lord, I, I thank you for John the Baptist, even, that, uh, that literally said, you know, it's not about me. It's about him. It's always been about Jesus. And, uh, Lord, we're grateful that we can play a role to be able to announce the, the groom, uh, to be able to assist the bride. And, uh, Lord, I just pray for a bright, bright future for, for ABC. And that, Lord, uh, every one of these people that are listening, God, would just feel a part of things, uh, a part of even this effort, because, Lord, we're here uh, to make you look good in, in that sense. So we just thank you. Thank you for the time in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, yeah, a few years ago when uh, Kobe Bryant retired at the very end, he kind of did a little speech. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it's... It was interesting because at the very end, he said something. He said, Mamba out. And uh, everybody just kind of laughed and smiled and clapped. Uh, I, I'm going to take a Mamba moment if I can. Pastor T, out.